Hey up everyone and welcome to part two of my exclusive interview with Lady C where we dive deeper into Megan the Narcissist, her mother Doria's missing years, where was she and did Megan set her father Thomas Markle Sr. up to fail? Oh, it might not be a coincidence after all, guys. But please don't forget, Lady C has just released an awesome new book, Megan and Harry, The Real Story, Persecutors or Victims, the updated edition. It is out now. Go get it. I have personally read it from cover to cover, and I highly, highly, highly recommend it. With that being said, guys, let's jump into this, shall we? Now, looking onto Meghan's narcissism, uh, in 2022, a uh, political uh, named Meghan Markle as a narcissist alongside the likes of Donald Trump, Kanye West, Elon Musk. Now, it put me to mind, actually, Lady C, another book that you wrote a few years ago called uh, Daughter of Narcissus. And in it, you write the following uh, about your mother. Uh, you say, quote, uh, when are you going to learn that dearest mama is a consumer actress and utterly ruthless with it she'll do anything to prevail when she can't win as she hasn't in this instance she then tries to snatch a victory of sorts out of the jaws of defeat by making everyone feel sorry for her that way she remains the focus of all activity and thereby satisfies her lust for constant attention which in her sick way of thinking means her will is still prevailing now when i read your book there and i saw that i absolutely i was like Oh my goodness, because in my humble opinion, you could easily be talking about Meghan Markle here. Like, word for word, it is scary. Um, so with the prevailing thought in the community being that Meghan is indeed a narcissist, how has your upbringing uh, by a narcissistic mother enabled you to be an effective public opponent uh, against Meghan Markle? Well, may I say, Steph, I'm not against Meghan Markle. I would love to have embraced Meghan Markle. And indeed, at first, I thought it was wonderful, you know. And I, being Jamaican, I understood how what a wonderful chance it was and how Jamaicans all over, the, not only Jamaicans, people of colour all over the world, embraced her. And as, as one of, as my builder Carlisle said, he said, Lady C, we don't care what she's yard in the palace is all that count. And, and you know, but she has gradually unmasked herself as being, as a result of her conduct and the things she said and done, as a very malignant narcissist. And, you know, once you've come across somebody like my mother, there is a sameness to these people that there comes a point when you think, my goodness, it's the same act. It's the same play. And you may not be able to predict what they're going to do, but you certainly know what they are. Because the thing about narcissists is they don't even know what they're going to do tomorrow or next week or maybe even in three minutes from now because they are the ultimate scavengers and the ultimate opportunists and they just grab at everything that is available to be able to advance their selves, their interests, their ambitions, their lust for attention and to fill the emptiness that is actually the reality of what they are as individuals. If you can imagine somebody who is just a shell and doesn't really exist as a human being uh, the way you and I do, because most people have too many feelings. They don't have enough. They don't really have the emotions or the spiritual attributes that the average person has. And if you can imagine going through life not really feeling anything and everything has to be about sensation, it's pretty frightening. But once, you know, having, having not only lived through my mother, but written the book, because when I wrote, I wrote Daughter of Narcissus at the behest of Dr. Erica Freeman, 
who is one of the maybe four or five most eminent psychoanalysts of all time. And she was a friend of my sister-in-law and she was a, a friend of another friend of mine. And she knew the story and she said to me, you've got to write this book. And it was at a time that narcissism wasn't the hot topic that it is now. And she thought it would be helpful to people. And indeed it has been because I've got over the years thousands of letters from people who've read the book who said it helped them. But once you know what the name, once you know the name of the game and all the antics that they pull, once you've seen one, it becomes very easy to spot others. Maybe not initially if they're quite skilled, but, but and Ma Megan is not very skilled. Megan is actually quite a brazen and unsophisticated and obvious narcissist. But she is dangerous and she is frightening because people like that are, you know, because you don't know what's coming next. They don't know what's coming next. But you do know that whatever is coming is going to be adverse and it's going to be detrimental to not only your good interests, but their own good interests. I mean, had Megan been her friend instead of her own enemy, she would now be po possibly the most popular hu mother, popular, sorry, I'm tripping over my words, popular human being on earth, instead of which she's reviled. So she's not even a good friend to herself. And with her constant need for wanting everyone to feel sorry for her, uh, is Meghan Markle as a narcissist addicted to being the victim and victimizing herself? That's a very interesting question. I would say yes. She vict she she victimizes herself because as well as other people, and she doesn't realize that she's doing it. But but it's not only narcissism, she she displays, as Samantha Cohen said, the attributes, if you can use, and I'm being polite when I use that word, I could have used the word trait, but I'm using attributes to be polite. She displays the attributes of somebody who has antisocial aspects to her personality. Or as Samantha Markle said, Samantha, not Markle, Samantha Cohen said, she's a narcissistic sociopath. And that was the opinion of people who worked for her. Now, one of the classical symptoms of sociopathy is they need constant sympathy. At the very moment that they are creating havoc, they need your sympathy. So when you have a narcissistic sociopath, you have somebody with all of the grandiosity and all of the lust for attention and all of the, it's all about me and me, 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 and am I not great? And please feel sorry for me because nobody is telling me how great I am. Not everybody appreciates me and everybody should. You see, it's, it's a two-edged sword and it's extremely disconcerting to, to observe, but even more disconcerting to live with. I feel very sorry for everybody who's involved with her, including herself. <laughs> My goodness. Well, going into everyone else that's around her, uh, namely her mother, Daria. So uh, you go into her family and you mention uh, in regards to Daria, a uh, quote, uh, that she lived a life of such extreme privacy that the question has been asked, what, if anything, she has to hide? Now, um, you touched upon this in the interview with Annie Signor over on Popcorn Palace. Um, now, again, the theory goes that Daria was a bit of conspiracy theory, whatever, rumoured, incarcerated during that period when it seemed like she was out of Meghan's life. Now, whatever was going on during that period, I'm not asking you to go into specifics, of course, Lady C, but if it did come out, is it something that could be big enough to destroy Meghan and Harry? Or is it just something and nothing, really, in the grand scheme of things? It can't destroy Meghan and Harry because it's not Meghan and Harry. You know, whatever Doria's issues are, it's Doria. And, I mean, she has been very well protected by her ex-husband. I mean, he has been very careful 
to never betray any of her secrets, which I think is very commendable and shows what a very, very decent person he is. Because quite frankly, if ever anybody deserved to have their secrets bandied about, it's her because she has also encouraged her daughter. I mean, I know this from members of the family. She was always pushing fire with Megan from Megan was a little girl, you know. I think she has helped to distort Megan. And I think that she has, she has played cards with Megan that have given Megan complexes. But I mean, Megan is a middle-aged woman now, so she can't use her mother as an excuse. But I think Doria has, according to what I have been told by people who were there at the time, that Doria undermined Megan. Uh, and Doria was dripping poison in Megan's air the same way Megan has done with Harry. Very destructive. Yeah, very destructive indeed. Uh, and asking about the other parent, uh, Thomas Markle Sr. So uh, you wrote in your book uh, that the palace actually offered to protect her family. Uh, but by not agreeing to the palace protecting her father, did Meghan actually set him up, set him up to fail? Uh, which led to those staged photographs prior to the wedding, especially when you know that the photographer who took the stage photos, Jeff Rayner, actually works with Megan to this day. I don't see that as a coincidence, but is that just an innocent coincidence or is there something more to that? Well, Freud says there's no such thing as a coincidence. And certainly in this instance, it, it would stretch credulity to think that any of that was a coincidence. First of all, Megan was offered assistance for both her parents before the wedding that the royal family would fly out people who would assist both the parents. And Meghan accepted it on her mother's behalf, notwithstanding the fact her mother was not as exposed as her father in terms of access to the paparazzi, et cetera, because he lives in a, in a very exposed environment, whereas the mother didn't. And But Meghan accepted for her mother, but not for her father. And when her father was complaining to her and saying he needed assistance, she and Harry said, oh, you know, just don't speak to them. And then Meghan will have known that her father is a sort of individual that the pressure builds up with. And it built up with him to the extent that he ended up having two heart attacks and then a stroke later on. And I think there is a valid hypothesis to be forwarded that Megan knew exactly what she was doing and chose to do it. And this is certainly the belief of her own family, that none of this has been an accident. And of course, she will say, oh, well, I didn't do anything. But as she herself has pointed out repeatedly, sometimes silence is complicity. And by not doing anything when she could have and should have done something, she is guilty of sins of omission. Now, Megan went to a Catholic school. Megan knows the whole Catholic principle of sins of omission and sins of commission and sins of omission can be as great as sins of omission so but megan is very good at uh avoiding saying something get and hinting at it and getting everybody else to see it and say well i never said it or i never did it but she nevertheless is the one who is there conducting the orchestra and making sure they hit the notes she wants them to hit. And so, no, I I have to say, I have listened to what her father and her sister have said about this. And I also have seen the way Megan has functioned and some of the people around whom she has functioned. Uh, who, and I'm now referring to another photographer uh, who... I who got Miss Carl Larson is his name, who 
who injected himself into the scenario when I was going to host Thomas Markle for Ascot. And of course, it never happened because he ended up having a heart, he had ended up having a stroke. Uh, but I also saw his vulnerability just interacting with him and making the arrangements that were being made. And Carl Larson, who again is also another paparazzo with whom Megan has had a working relationship before and continues to have. And I think Thomas Markle was very naive in think in, in believing, but he's he's actually a very open and he's almost naive person. I mean, he's you know, he's not he's he's been very successful at his job, but he's never really been exposed to being to being a celebrity or to to the machinations of the press. And I think there is a very almost, well, there is a very naive element to him. And he allowed Carl Larson into his life. And Carl Larson tried to hijack the visit that he was going to have in England with, partly with me. And Carl Larson betrayed my trust because he was not supposed to tell anybody that Thomas Markle was coming here. And he tried to sell it to the newspapers. So I just dumped him. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the sort of right. caliber of person that, that Meghan Markle mixes with and uses on a daily basis. I'm sorry, you know, I don't believe in 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 lying down with rabid, flea-ridden dogs. Because aside from the fact they not only bite you and maybe give you rabies, but they definitely give you fleas. Yes, they do. And that, you guys, was part two of my exclusive interview with Lady C in part three that's going to be released on Monday the 8th of April, 9 o'clock UK time, 4 o'clock Eastern. Things start getting really juicy. Lady C discusses Megs's suicidal tendencies, but also as well delves into the rumours of her apparent possible fake pregnancies, whether Prince Archie and Princess Lilibet are real or not, and also, will she actually lose her title? So stay tuned for that, and on your way out, if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to join our Alternate Tribe. I'll be honest with you, help us get to 100k so we can get that silver play button right there, and hopefully cause a Christopher Boozy meltdown on Twitter. Like, share, comment down below, your opinion, conspiracy theories, whatevers, and... Until the next time, you guys. Laters.